risky up on hills or coastal areas that are prone to flooding. Um, but there's, yeah, there's in some cities, we've got as much as 30 to 70% of the population are living in so-called informal settlements. Um, and really our understanding of these settings has not kind of kept up with the growth with their growth and we do have we have major gaps in our understandings about what influences health in these places and what we can do to improve it. Um, so it's just a bit of background. Um, and so what are the infrastructural challenges when dealing with COVID-19 in these settings or indeed with health and epidemics generally because there's a lot of overlap. Um, there's some obvious ones so the physical infrastructure and under that I could you know sanitation, housing, road, road networks, other aspects of this spatial environment the fact that this is lacking or substandard in many of these settings has a direct impact on transmission risks. Um, and it's been said time and time again, you know, washing hands and social distancing is impossible when there's no reliable water or where it's too expensive or where it's shared um, equally in public spaces and homes are too crowded or too congested to, to socially distance. Um, and beyond COVID, of course, we know that many of these kind of environmental um, conditions are, ba are bad for health in general, so poor or air, poor sanitation, all of these things kind of spread disease and, and cause ill health. Um, we can also think about public health infrastructure. So this is very limited, again, in informal settlements. And although it, it will be varied across the world, we can't generalize too much about any of these settings. Um, but there is a, a common pattern where there is the, an absence of high quality health care in these settings and instead a reliance and a proliferation of kind of informal, unregulated, um, private providers, so drug sellers or pharmacists or kind of nurses, um, and that we yeah, and we're seeing this kind of this that also with COVID we see that that also extends to kind of diagnostic and surveillance system capacity. So these are again in places where governments tend not to have good reach or oversight into into these spaces, making it unlikely that cases will be detected, and it also means that you know it's an everyday reality that people get poor quality healthcare. But the thing I really, finally, the thing I really wanted to talk to you about was um, something that's often overlooked, which is the social and political infrastructure. Um, and so COVID, like most major epidemics, is demonstrating that epidemics are far more than just health crises. They are also social and economic um, crises. And we've known that our responses to epidemics need to be mindful of social dynamics and context for a long time, certainly since the West African Ebola outbreak, which is something I'd worked a lot on previously, but disappointingly, that's often overlooked when it comes to designing responses. Um, and how well we um, can respond to such crises depends, I think, on the quality of this existing social and political infrastructure. Um, and when it comes to informal set urban settlements, there's some quite striking um, dynamics at play, which I'd like to just set out. So first of all, um, there's a question around knowledge and under knowledge I would include data and evidence but also relationships. So on data there's really limited good quality evidence about some of these places. Governments don't tend to kind of collect data or don't disaggregate it sufficiently. Um, research data is, is kind of patchy and the result is that we don't have good profiles of the people who, who live in these places, their livelihoods um, or their relationships to the rest of the city. Um, and, you know, the ecologies of risk that hopefully um, that Jadeep and Noshim will talk about. Um, on, but on relationships, for reasons that I'll also kind of come to, um, there's often limited engagement with the people who, with the people who understand local dynamics, by, who, by which I mean the residents themselves. So often you find that a practice of kind of meaningful collaboration and dialogue, working with and listening to communities is, is elusive. Um, and so together, I think the gaps in both data and also relationships can preclude a good understanding of the conditions of, on the ground in such settlements. And it certainly precludes, pre precludes good policy making for kind of epidemic response or, for example, social protection to mitigate the control interventions. Um, second, there's also a politics of neglect and exclusion. So informal settlements are home to vulnerable populations, often kind of racial, ethnic or religious minorities, the poor more generally, um, migrants. Um, and these people tend to face, often face marginalization and discrimination. Um, 
and that and this can kind of manifest in yeah exclusionary policy and practice so for example dismissing people's claims dismissing their expertise denying their rights um denying them access to services there's also sometimes kind of strategic ignorance so you know actually some of the lack of data that i talked about is is due to the fact that governments don't actually want to collect data um because by collecting data on some of these places would kind of validate their existence so that's a kind of little a collection of some of the politics of neglect and exclusion um and all of this creates and sustains inequalities and it can amp it can amplify the conditions of vulnerability the the infrastructural vulnerabilities that i talked about um but it also harms people's ability to work together to address those vulnerabilities and it damages kind of cohesion it damages trust we hear a lot about trust in in response to epidemics so trust between people trust between rich and the you know elites and and poor um also between um residents of the settlements and authorities that often there's not good kind of positive relationships there um so very quickly i think what what has the impact of covid been in informal settlements um it has been very varied in some places um yes that, there was a lot of fear about it early on in the outbreak and some places have indeed been hit really hard by the virus um latin and some latin american cities and some parts of south asia but in other places particularly i'm thinking of kind of african settings it does seem that the virus hasn't hit as hard as people feared but they are facing kind of severe economic shit, um shocks um as a result of the kind of lockdowns that were enforced with violence very limited social protection to kind of to to, to mitigate any of those interventions um very high impact on kind of the informal trading businesses that that um lots of people in informal settlements and informal settlements rely on um and now we're really seeing kind of a prolonged economic kind of um slump in the future so so that that's likely to be quite protracted um and then there's also on the, there's also kind of a whole host of secondary health impacts that have happened due to the kind of often vertical nature of covid in, in interventions which mean that other essential health services have been have been disrupted so we're seeing all of those kind of impacts in, in informal settlements um but so despite the kind of the challenges that i've laid out um and the impacts there have been some really positive examples um we have seen th well throughout the world really a kind of a flourishing of kind of local support networks food carrying out things like food distribution doing community monitoring of cases there's really good examples of that happening in Kenya and Nigeria um and, and many other places um and in, in many of those examples where it seems to be working best is where there is kind of strong local organization and civil society already but where they've also been able to have good form good relationships with government to either kind of inform them or advocate um on behalf of residents and 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 particular vulnerable groups um and yeah so that's there's good examples of in Kenya so where there's SD the um SDI affiliated federations of the urban poor have really been kind of actively engaged with the ministry of health as i say monitoring cases testing and testing capacity um distributing food um and mapping possible spaces for care and for um isolation in their communities and critically feeding all that back into the government um to the government and other urban stakeholders so that's an example where that kind of social there was the foundations of strong kind of social social infrastructure that was actually kind of laid far in advance pre covid um and yeah um I will finish very quickly by just a quick word about transformations post covid. So many people say and hope that covid-19 will be a turning point. Um and we've had lots of discussion amongst ourselves about how realistic some of that is, but I think for that to be so we have to really begin to see beyond these technical or in the technical aspects of infrastructures um to also recognize these kind of social systems and social inf infrastructure to really concentrate on the quality of social relations collaborative practices um cohesion inclusivity all of these things which are going to be the basis for change um or maintaining the status quo Wonderful, Annie, thank you so much. Um, so moving straight on from there, I'm going to turn now to Noshin, 
who are, I think, drawing on your deep experience of what's going on in Karachi and has been going on over recent months. Give us your view on building back better in cities of the future. What are the implications? Thank you so much, Melissa. So I'm going to do some screen sharing uh, for a PowerPoint that I have put together. And uh, so if you can just bear with me and let me just bring that up because I would like to go through some images and a little bit of text, which I hope will be helpful uh, in terms of our discussion today. So much of what uh, Annie has talked about also resonates, especially on the issue of trust, building trust, pathways to inclusivity. And I think that is the hardest part, the most challenging part. So before I get to that, let me set a little bit of context. So um, the, in Karachi, the situation vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19 pandemic has been uh, quite uh, interesting to observe in the sense that the pandemic has overlapped with other crises. Uh, 2020 has been the year of the wettest monsoon in Karachi and also the hottest summer. And, uh, and Karachi, and especially the province in which Karachi is embedded, which is Sindh, is also very much uh, in the eye of the storm, so to speak, in terms of uh, climate change or climate crisis related risks. Although it isn't entirely clear that if the, mon if the monsoon season or the, or the very uh, sort of um, volatile uh, summers that we're looking at now are directly related to climate crisis, but something is happening. So this, these last five or six months have been uh, very volatile, very challenging for urban dwellers in Karachi. So, uh, but in May 2020 alone, amidst the COVID-19 lockdown, Karachi experienced two heat waves. The first one from May 5th to the 8th, and the second from May 17th to the 22nd, with temperatures rising to 40 degrees Celsius. And then following that, in August 2020, we had a deluge uh, a rainfall, 345 millimeters of rainfall in two days, which essentially led to a complete infrastructural collapse. And as a consequence, neighborhoods, markets were sub sub submerged for weeks. There were lengthy power outages that are uh, certain neighborhoods in Karachi that actually didn't get back power for not only days, but even weeks. Uh, more than 100 people lost their lives. Many, many more lost their homes. And the estimated economic loss of this was around 150 million US dollars. Low income, working class neighborhoods, informal settlements uh, were, the, were hit the hardest. So just a little factoid in Karachi, around 62 to 63% of Karachi's population resides in informal settlements. So according to the 2017 census, Karachi has a population of 16 million. Although um, you know, even that figure is contested, it actually is probably a great deal higher uh, across 20, more than 20 million. So we're talking about um, you know, a very significant number of people who reside in, in informal settlements. But alongside this, uh, high income areas were also affected by this, uh, by this rainfall. So these are just some images, uh, just to give you an idea <clears throat> of the kind of challenges and suffering that people had to endure in the month of August and across uh, a wide variety of settlements in Karachi. And I'm just going to share here very quickly, a, a, you know, a video. Uh, I'm not, I put it on, on mute. <clears throat> this was shared with me from a colleague who lives in Orangi town. And this is Alikar colony, Orangi town, which uh, Orangi town is considered one of the largest informal settlements in Karachi, although parts of Orangi town are no longer informal in, 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 in the very basic sense of the word. But this kind of, <clears throat> shows that the degree of the deluge and and what people had to had to had to experience when this when this rainfall was happening so so this is all you know amidst the covid-19 crisis you have the the heat and then you have uh, you have this uh, the deluge of this monsoon season so you have kind of these multiple crises cascading into one another uh, you know and and the infrastructure collapse i mentioned playing a very important role in this so uh, just some just to give you an idea of some very basic stats on, on uh, data-wise breakdown of COVID-19 cases in Karachi. So, it's, so the story begins in February and then starts off with one case and slowly it begins to, to grow. And by October 4th, we have around 89,000 cases. Uh, although it might be a lot more than that, this is essentially what is reported. And uh, in terms of Karachi's different districts, 
uh, the total number of cases, the manner in which they are spread, there's a good deal of unevenness. And, I, and we're not entirely sure why there is this unevenness. So there is no reason to suggest that Karachi East has higher cases because there are more informal settlements there or that it's a high density zone or that it's a more poverty stricken zone. We don't actually know what, you know, the sort of the, the actual, uh, the facts or dynamics behind these numbers. But this is just to give you, give you an idea of the degree of unevenness that has been reported by the Sindh government in, in terms of uh, the cases reported. So, um, so how was this COVID-19 situation managed? So local police and paramilitary rangers were deployed on ground to ensure restrictive measures. But alongside this, the federal government also rolled out a massive economic relief package, package uh, you know, worth about 900 million US dollars. And uh, this particular program has also been uh, uh, sort of criticized that it actually didn't reach out to every family. Now, this was across Pakistan. So within Karachi itself, there's been a good deal of controversy that uh, different kinds of households were left out of these, uh, of um, you know, getting access to the emergency cash, cash program. And there are complex reasons as to why this might have happened. So one of the things that has uh, confronted me as a very, very big challenge in this present moment of the pandemic is that, you know, what kind of methodologies can we deploy to understand what is happening in people's lives as far as vulnerable populations are concerned? And, and the question over here is that what is methodology in the time of pandemic? When firsthand data collection becomes particularly difficult due to the nature of the pandemic. So one of uh, uh, an interesting way in which we sort of, uh, my colleagues and I tried to get around this was uh, for a project that I'm currently involved in, which is called Cool Infrastructures, Life with Heat in the Off-Grid City. This has been funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund. This is a three-year project that, um, that tries to understand vulnerability through the lens of heat. And uh, I am working with partners across the United Kingdom, Cameroon, Indonesia, Germany, and India to, to understand you know, what are the dynamics or the relationship between heat and vulnerability. So we decided to actually conduct a remote survey of 4,000 low-income households across four cities, Karachi, Yawaunde, Jakarta, and Hyderabad. So I'll share with you some of the preliminary data that is now coming up that we're kind of um, sort of uh, pulling apart now and, and trying to figure out in terms of this Geopol survey. So from June 26th to July 27th, Geopol conducted a randomized telephonic survey in Karachi. Uh, and sample of 1,100 people. And this was conducted over two rounds to understand people's living conditions and impacts of COVID-19 and heat mitigation strategies. And the targets were uh, low-income households. So we ended up with 504 female and 596 male participants. One of the most hard-hitting or most important pieces of information that comes out right before us is that people reported that their incomes did decrease. And this was reported for most of the respondents. 52% of male and 45% of female respondents reported that their incomes had significantly decreased because of the pandemic. And over here, I have a quick uh, graph to share with you uh, in terms of the significantly decreased uh, proportion. So uh, along with this, we are looking at, uh, in terms of infrastructure vulnerabilities, we're looking at low-income households whose dependence on electricity is predominantly through informal connections. These could be what are typically called in, in South Asia, Kunda connections, or, or what uh, the you know, electric utility companies would call illegal connections. And similarly for water, for drinking water, we're looking at uh, a category of households that rely on uh, communal tax, et cetera. So the infrastructural dynamics within these neighborhoods are, are not uh, you know, typical of what you would find in upper income or elite neighborhoods in the city where you have pipe water connections and, and uh, you know, 24 hours of electricity and especially generators. Alongside this, because we were also interested in the heat, uh, you know, in the relationship between heat and, and people having to, you know, being forced to stay within their homes because it was a complete lockdown. So 46% of the respondents reported that the temperatures inside their homes were very hot to hot. 60% reported that the walls of their homes were made of reinforced con concrete, as were the, the roofs and the flooring was made of cement. And one of the reasons what, why we were very interested in, you know, in this issue of materiality, the materiality of homes, because we're, we're, we're interested in trying to understand, uh, especially, you know, vis-a-vis -vis vulnerable populations living in 
slums or in uh, low income informal housing that you know how does the the relationship between heat and vulnerability pandemic uh, play out vis-a-vis -vis the material conditions of their homes so this is some interesting data that is uh, you know coming coming out of uh, out of the survey and we're sort of you know as we go along uh, we're going to sort of unpack it even further so during this time period which was uh, you know july for temperature outside their homes, 30% felt that it was intolerable and 22% felt that it was very difficult to tolerate. So the heat had impacted people in terms of their bodily responses and experiences from people feeling sweaty to thirsty to hot and fatigued and other symptoms that participants reported were, uh, you know, feeling nauseous or vomiting with blurred vision, dizziness, muscle weakness and, you know, poor quality of, of sleep. So in the aftermath of this urban flooding crisis that hit Karachi uh, particularly hard in August, uh, there's been all kinds of things going on at the federal and the provincial government le uh, levels. So uh, there is um, a, a, a very ambitious Karachi transformation plan that is uh, being rolled out in the coming months. And this is a 6.8 billion um, US dollars uh, plan to mitigate the risk of urban flooding and also to launch a series of infrastructure development projects. But interestingly, this entire transformation plan is it's centralized. So it's essentially the military, the provincial, and the federal governments that are going to be handling this. And there is no room made so, so far for local government systems or any form of participatory, participatory planning at the community levels uh, to encourage uh, you know, in, in involvement. One of the key aspects of this transformation plan is to clean the main drainage channels of the city that were flooded, which caused much of the deluge. And what is interesting is that there are approximately 80 informal settlements that, uh, that exist along these, made, uh, these major draining channels. And the committee that is in charge of the transformation plan has already announced that these people are going to have to be displaced and relocated. And you know the details haven't been shared yet in terms of you know, what relocation is going to encompass. Now, all of this is very fascinating and also at the same time, very worrying in the Karachi context where displacement is, has been an, an ongoing dynamic for the last uh, two decades. And this is something that my colleagues and I have been looking at in a different project at the Karachi Urban Lab, where we've actually estimated that over 600,000 people have been displaced in the past two decades in Karachi due to infrastructure and urban development projects. So we are now looking at a moment when new forms of displacements are going to arise as, as a result, uh, possibly as a result of the Karachi transformation plan. And of course, this is going to have differentiated impacts because what we found in our displacement study is that women, men and women are, are impacted very differently when it comes to, to evictions and displacements. So what kind of urban future are we looking at in terms of uh, you know, a city like Karachi? So one of the things that I'm arguing about is that in this new moment of infrastructural uh, urban development regime that is emerging, this is, this is part of an emerging pro-growth coalition of multiple stakeholders that are reshaping Karachi. So it's also a policy environment that is unfolding at the nexus of infrastructure development and disaster risk management. So, so the, there are multiple questions that arise along, alongside this. You know, whose future are we looking at? What kind of publics? are we talking about that are going to be impacted by this policy environment? Whose interest is at the forefront? And then who decides what is risk? And risk is also something that is highly gendered. Uh, what kind of solid solidarities are we, uh, you know, are we looking at on ground? And you know, what kind of resistance is going to emerge as a consequence of these changes? How will this take shape? These are incredibly important and very, very challenging questions uh, at this moment, and I don't necessarily have answers to all of these, but um, I'll end it right there so that we can have a more uh, open-ended discussion on these issues. Thank you. No, Sheen, thank you so much. And those are seriously devastating pictures. Thank you very much for showing those to us. So I'm going to turn now finally to Jaideep to give us some thoughts about, in a way, as some thumbing up thoughts and some thoughts about what the future holds for cities um, in the light of the developments we've seen over the last period and looking to the future. Thanks, um, Melissa. What one truly wonderful presentations from, from Noshin and, and Annie. And 
I'll try and in the next few minutes uh, add my own thoughts and reflections and try and sum up as you as you say. And you know the the one thing that really strikes me, you know, that really everything about this pandemic seems to be at a monumental scale. You know, the deaths, the subsequent devastation, uh, even the the sorts of personal everyday struggles of marginalized people that both Ani and, and Oshin have spoken about are amplified as we sort of take note of the prolonged impacts on their on their lives. You know, so much so, Melissa, that it, it's become almost easy to forget that monumental and perhaps permanent shifts in our ecological, um, environmental, societal, infrastructure lives were already underway. Um, you know, so, so Annie's and Oshin's scholarly work, and I really recommend others to, to take a look at the, at the recent work that both of them have been involved in. Um, it, it sort of highlights the missteps in public health policy, in urban planning, and showcases this long and complex history that in itself is quite monumental. But I, I just wanted to reiterate the, I suppose, the monumentality of the infrastructural story here. Uh, and that begins um, with acknowledging that the overall sorts of population increases that uh, Annie was talking about and the upward shift in the percentage of people living in urban built up areas are projected to add two and a half billion people uh, to the current world's urban population of 4.2 billion by 2050. Now, virtually all of this growth is going to happen in Asia and Africa. Indeed, India, China, Nigeria will account for nearly 40% of it, um, you know, India will add over 400 million urban residents, China, 250 million, Nigeria, just under 200 million. And half of these will reside in small and medium sized towns. So really the, the grand challenge that we face is, for example, in India, uh, they'll need to build a city the size of Chicago every year from here on in, uh, if it's projected urban growth is to be accommodated, if it's urban people are to be serviced, if they're healthy, productive and prosperous. And so globally, we have to build in the next sort of decades, uh, how much we've built in the past thousand years. And simply put, you know, about 75% of that infrastructure that we require by 2050, you know, so the, the buildings, the homes, the roads, the, the parks, pipes, wires, just simply don't exist today. And so this requires a monumental amount of investment uh, and this graph, and I promise this is the only graph that I have, um, sort of compares investment to date and, and investment required in the, in the future uh, with defense expenditure globally. And you can see the, the sorts of monumentality of this comparison. And now, now that COVID-19 is fundamentally reordering how we interact with and within the built environment, there's understandably a rush to act, right? To, to solve these immediate problems of, of COVID, to answer what comes next. And you know, Melissa, on a positive note, we've seen glimpses of some of, of what sustainable transformations could look like. Um, you know, without road traffic and construction activities, cities have dramatically reduced the amount of particulate matter in the air. Um, but you know, as my panelists have, have been, you're right to be skeptical about the longevity of these changes, right? Will we simply go back to the old normal? And of course, those industries and capital interests that have benefited tremendously from uh, sort of hardwired dependence on fossil fuels and un unsustainable resource extraction certainly hope we do go back uh, to the old normal. Um, but there's a deeper concern and both Annie and uh, Noshin have touched upon this because, uh, and certainly my research highlights as well, that the technical interventions to COVID often branded as solutions to the pandemic have tended to overshadow a critical view of whether the interventions contribute to inclusive, resilient, um, sustainable responses from the perspective of economically and socially disadvantaged urban residents. You know, many of the, the sort of tech-based interventions, um, particularly like apps for testing and tracing, uh, have failed to recognize that economically weak urban residents are tied to urban infrastructures in what are exploitative and often compulsory relationships 
And yet techno utopian narratives are quite an easy sell, you know, particularly to those who already have access to digital infrastructures and, and therefore stand to benefit from technological interventions. And this serves as some sort of an illusory alternative for, for meaningful local action. And of course, all of our sort of combined and long-standing research in low-income and so-called uh, informal neighborhoods tells us that uh, people are forced to make difficult trade-offs between their health, their well-being, in hope of accessing opportunities that agglomeration offers. And as we uh, you know, I've heard from, from Noshin, uh, our responses to the pandemic have assumed that everyone has equal access to infrastructures of health and essential services, but in fact, they're anything but equal. They've also assumed that labor relationships are equal and allow a degree of autonomy, a, a, a dignity of work, when in fact millions labor without worker rights um, or adequate protections and are dependent on, on daily wages to survive. Um, and of course, the responsive, uh, responses have also assumed that the built environment is somehow static and that it can be easily controlled or locked down. Um, when we know, when well, certainly we, we, we now know that uh, just how intricate and interdependent human infrastructure interactions really are. So what does this imply for building back better or I suppose building forward? Uh, my take is that uh, future infrastructural visions of a smart city or whatever may, they may be must not assume equality of access, but neither can they leave behind the billions that depend on informal economies or live, work, play, innovate in informal spaces. The, the types of transformations being suggested uh, require an immense alteration of societal relationships with and within the built environment. Some require enormous redirection of resources, while others, you know, simply are impossible without meaningful civic engagement and participation, you know, and the risk of ossifying sort of pre-existing inequalities and persecutions and structural failures are quite real. I think the social wage uh, that Annie spoke of and, the, and, and sort of community support uh, are also important, so we must look beyond the sort of engineering and material resilience alone to account for ecological and societal social resilience. Um, and uh, Melissa, one final point, if I may, um, because so much has been said in this debate around COVID and in, in future urban spaces about urban density. And I'd just like to underscore a point here because it would be amiss if I, if I didn't. You know, pandemic responses have almost in, uh, inherently looked to de-densify the built environment uh, and heighten surveillance of it. Now, of course, this, this sort of response has been critiqued uh, and many have argued that it's completely misplaced because it's not density, but how we manage our lives within dense environments that's important. But I just wanted to end by pointing out um, Colin McFarlane's new work on the politics of density in urban protest and social movements. Right, so, so he is pointing out that the political crowd of urban protest is not quite the same thing as high density. Right, there's a, a difference between the density of people as a sociological or demographic category and the density of people as a political category. And of course, our research with community groups and federations that Annie referred to as well that advocate for and are comprised of marginalized and least resourced urban residents has long underscored the critical importance of community engagement and advocacy in claiming housing and livelihood rights in accessing essential services that really have been key to people's survival over these last decades. So even through the pandemic, as we've seen, um, these social movements have provided this essential support. So, and finally, a big question when we think about the material and physical dimensions of the built environment in post-COVID futures, um, a, a big question is, is, is a look at, I suppose, how the local political is also being reshaped and whether it reforms in new ways. I think that, if anything, uh, is vitally important to understanding post-COVID urban futures, how they pan out in cities of the global south.
So with that, back to you, Melissa. I'm looking forward to some rich and uh, fruitful discussion. Fantastic, Jodi. Thank you so much, and thank you to all three um, presenters. So we've got some really interesting questions that have come into the chat, and I'm going to I'm going to read um, a selection of them, and then ask you in the panel. A couple of them are directed particularly to one or the other of you. Um, some others are more general. So perhaps just be selective about the things you really want to respond to and be, be quite brief because we don't have so much time. So the first one comes from Hwasi El Kuchi to any of you, who says that the COVID-19 epidemic has formed a critical juncture in state society relationships, perhaps especially in non-democratic countries. How can we trust development programs or future visions of urban development? How can we ensure um, that support funds, perhaps directed to content countries in the context of development and, and the epidemic, actually get to people, actually contribute to their developments? I think it's a question about accountability, partly. Um, then we've got a question from Tanjila Drishti, again to, to all of you or any of you, um, saying the majority of slum residents, she says in South Asia, but perhaps it's, it's more broadly, work in the informal sector. And in the light of the pandemic, they're of course facing public health crisis, a loss of livelihood, and in many cases also increased shelter uncertainty as they're unable to pay slum landlords for the shacks they live in. Um, and that might lead in turn to reverse migration from urban to rural. So um, Tanjila would like, like it if you could share a bit more um, about interventions taken up by organizations on the ground to tackle these compound crises faced by the urban poor on top of the existing challenges they're, al they're already facing. So what have we learned about, as it were, bottom-up interventions, some more examples. Um, then there's a question, a very important question, I think, from Fahad Zulfikar um, to all panelists again, but she actually directs it particularly to, to Noshin to outline um, some gender dimensions on what acts if women are impacted differently than men um, in the context of the, the pandemic, but also the displacement and other crises that follow from it. Um, and then two more, if you can make some notes. Um, the next is from Amna Sawa, who asks, when infrastructure projects are carried out by elite policy communities, and then elite academic communities research them, how do you bring in the perspective of the researched and particularly of vulnerable groups in this kind of context? How do you navigate your own positionality in your research, um, particularly as you're researching communities who've been hit particularly hard? And I think this might be about this pandemic, but maybe also, Annie, you could reflect a little bit on your experiences around Ebola. And then final question, how can we feed virtual infrastructure into these discussions? What's the, the reach of, of the internet and digital spaces in urban informal settings? Could this be a tool for positive transformation? I think Jaideep's addressed that a little bit, perhaps from a slightly more, more cynical viewpoint, but are there some positives perhaps that we've overlooked in terms of perhaps building strong social relationships or helping with service delivery? Um, and, and finally, um, this is a question to, to Jaideep. Um, it says, Dr. Iona recently asserted that a paradigm shift from a top-down to a bottom-up approach is needed for making cities of the global south smart. What's your view on that as a, as a proposition? So there's a lot there, probably can't answer all of it, but I'd ask each of you to pick out a couple of questions and perhaps finish with a final remark um, that could be a response on the debate overall, as you've heard it this evening. Um, so maybe we'll go in the same order. Annie, do you want to, to kick us off there? Um, yes, okay, so there's a few questions that, um, the one about um, accountability and then also bottom-up um, interventions and then this the kind of this, the one about elite um, policy making. Mm -hmm. In a way, I, yeah, so there's, there's there's my answer to kind of all of them, whether it's research practice or um, or policy making, is that we need to have a real shift towards more 
um, include, yeah, policy processes which are inclusive, which are participatory, which pay attention to power dynamics, re like really in a, in a seriously meaningful way. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work now being done on kind of taking in, not just interdisciplinary, but intersectoral and inter, um, um, inter, oh my goodness, I've forgotten the word. <laughs> intersectional <laughs> um, intersectional approaches so um, Jaydeep and I are actually working on a, a large research consortium in um, funded by GCRF called the Arise um, program which is looking at kind of urban um, urban equity and accountability and there yeah we're, we're, we're trying to kind of um, mainstream all of those approaches um, the work that we're doing is the research practice is actually um, working with so with particularly with um, often with the federate these kind of federations of urban urban poor but specifically with um, getting people trained up to do co to, to do actually be part of the research so pro, pa, like participatory research not just um, kind of consulting them but actually getting them to kind of design the projects with us um, actually um, do the analysis together we're at the stage we're doing I'm doing that currently in Sierra Leone and come up with the kind of policy or accountability solutions together with us so that's I think that's the approach um, for that um, on on the Ebola um, experience, yeah, I think that I mean basically, if if you can cast your mind back to West Africa, um, the Ebola outbreak there, there was um, many of these kind of problems that we were seeing, which was kind of epidemic response being driven by essentially elite policy communities that were often out of touch with the kind of priorities and perspectives of the communities that they were trying to trying to reduce the epidemic in um, and that 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 outbreak only really kind of turned around once um, there was really much more meaningful kind of engagement with what mm -hmm. what people's kind of often radically kind of different mm -hmm. perspectives were um, and and involving them critically in actually design coming up with the response strategies that made sense for them and their lives whether it was burial practices or local surveillance or kind of local um yeah, yeah. mobility kind of controls anyway right i'll stop there <laughs> yeah so some learning from previous outbreaks which could well be taken into what's going on now around covid so oh. Nosheen, um, how about you pick up on any of the, some, there were some specific questions there for you as well. So yeah. pick up on, on those. Thank you, Melissa. I'll take the two questions. The first one is from Fahad Zulfikar. So, uh, so very quickly, uh, impacts, uh, you know, what is, so what on, what access women are impacted differently. So, uh, so very briefly, uh, so my colleagues and I have been involved for the last 24 months in a, in a very extensive project on looking at uh, the impact of land displacements on, uh, on uh, low income for lower to middle income populations across Karachi. And, and we worked in about 15 different study sites and uh, we also looked at, at resettlement dynamics. And across the board, we found which I mean, our findings are going to be out in, in first quarter 2021 in a, in a report that Karachi Urban Lab will put out on online displacements in urban Pakistan. So, so a lot of the details on uh, sort of the complex gender dynamics of displacement and resettlement are, are in that report. But very briefly, women as caretakers of their households, their families, uh, their, their ties, their, their social networks that are embedded in their communities, uh, those kinds of dynamics that are ruptured, disrupted, and, uh, you know, are, are precisely the kinds of things that generate the most concern, the most anxiety, and the most uncertainty for women. And, of course, uh, typically in informal settlements, uh, women's livelihood systems, which are also many times informal, they work within their homes. Uh, those kinds of disruptions also, you know, so there are these, so social networks, uh, deep histories that connect women with their particular neighborhoods, their communities and their families, their female friends, all of this come together to create particularly uh, deleterious impacts on, on women's 
psychological and social well-being. And there are also specific issues related to resources. So uh, displacements usually end up exacerbating certain kinds of inequalities uh, relative to resources. So uh, in resettlement programs, women's access to resources, in fact, sometimes get depleted or many times get depleted. And there's plenty of literature to support this kind of evidence. Mm. Veena Agarwal's absolutely you know, brilliant work uh, on, um, on rural land displacements, although urban land displacements, uh, you know, one could compare that, especially the position of when women and, and land ownership in, in patriarchal societies is a particularly controversial one. So I hope that answers uh, your question, Fahad. So it, when I turn to Amna, so Amna, your, your question actually has two components. So the first component is about infrastructure projects carried, carried out by elite policy communities. So in the Pakistan context, that's always been the case. So that's like a past dependency. So uh, in Pakistan, planning uh, at all scales, so planning is not just about urban planning, planning is also about national planning, it's planning the five-year plan and so on and so forth. It's always been an elite exercise. And unfortunately, we haven't seen, you know, the dial shift radically in the Pakistan context yet. Uh, at least I haven't seen that happen, for instance, in the context of cities like Karachi. And in the context of the new Karachi transformation plan, this is also, it seems increasingly evident that once again, we have a very centralized form of planning in which the military, of course, is, is leading the way. So your, your second question is uh, about, um, elite academic communities researching vulnerable groups. Mm. So uh, how, do, how does one bring a perspective? You know, re this is a very, very important question. So if I can just sort of uh, speak from my own positionality. So as a researcher, I'm always anxiety ridden in the, in, in the field. So there is never a moment when I am not questioning my positionality. So uh, it's, it's, it's never smooth. It is, it is always a complex challenge. Secondly, the co-production of knowledge. This is something that we are very deeply committed to in the Karachi Urban Lab. And so in our displacement project, you know, the communities that we were working with, uh, we have, we've had very close ties with community-based organizations, with activists, uh, and our research team uh, often comprised people from within those communities. So, so you know, I know that co-production of knowledge sounds like a very sexy word, but it is also something that is quite possible when it is done in a very conscious and a very reflexive way. So I think when you bring a degree of reflexivity towards your, towards your research in the field and you're always questioning your privileges and your social capital, I think that uh, you know, those, those challenges can be addressed. The pathway is not necessarily uh, you know, linear and, and straightforward, but, uh, and, and, it's, and in this present moment of the pandemic crisis, and this is the question that I raised in my presentation, you know, what does research methodology mean in this current moment? This is it's a very risky situation. Uh, do I put myself in the field and in doing so, I risk the communities that I'm studying? Uh, that is not ethical. So the question of ethics is something that I am confronting all the time as a researcher. It never ends. I hope that answers your yeah. question. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Nasheen. Um, so Jaideep, I'm going to turn to you in a minute for some responses, but I'm actually gonna add in one more question that um, I think is, is one for you that's just, just come in from Omotuyole and Bali who is really asking about the threat that increasing urban populations might create for economic development and indeed for, for environment. Um, and asks actually, um, what do we think about this change and what might policymakers be doing to develop rural areas and to develop their infrastructure and job creation um, in order to perhaps protect cities from this rapid growth. And I'd really like your opinion on that, given the, 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 the big changes you showed us and indeed that all the panelists commented on about these, this very rapid trend in urbanization. Is it something that one has to accept? Is it inevitable? Is it something that actually policy should be attempting to, to reverse or mitigate in some ways? But there are other questions too. So I'll turn back to you and you're going to end up with the last word as well. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Melissa. And these are some excellent uh, questions and comments and I've been trying to keep up with them. I, just on, on, that, uh, on that question that you've just raised, Melissa, I, I, I certainly um, tend to agree with its thrust that um, the, 
the, the, the, the type of inevitability that we speak of in terms of urbanization needs to recognize that cities themselves are not isolated from their rural surroundings. I mean, and this is the, the, the main point about the three of us on the panel today referring to infrastructures rather than city limits, because these infrastructures are, are you know, reach deep into the countryside. Uh, and indeed, um, not simply in, in, their, in their physical manifestation, but also through the movement of people back and forth. Um, and of course, food systems uh, that are, you know, so dependent on, on ecological systems that uh, we do need to take account of them. Now, that doesn't preclude us from recognizing that, uh, you know, there is some kind of essentiality about cities because urban spaces do contribute you know, some enormous amount of the CO2 uh, emissions in the world because so much of building occurs here. So there are certain types of issues that do need this essentialist view of cities, but we certainly need to have a slightly broader view because indeed, if we think that cities can do it alone, that ends up worsening the, the situation um, rather than a collective view uh, of it. I, I did want to also address the point around uh, bottom-up digital infrastructures and the sort of more inclusive visions of, um, of tech. Uh, and I agree, Iona's work is, has been really influential in this regard. And I, again, I, I recommend that people pick up uh, her books and papers to, on, 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 this, uh, on this issue, because we are learning a lot about what bottom-up technology looks like at the moment. And this goes well beyond the sorts of frugal innovation, the Jugard economy that we've been looking at for, for quite some time now, because we're, we're understanding the temporality of digital infrastructural change, because people connect to digital infrastructures differently and at different paces. Um, and indeed from our work uh, with smart city missions in India, we find that cities are on different trajectories. You cannot assume that cities can simply log into digital transformations the same way that others have because the pace is different and this seems like a very simplistic point but transformation tends to happen either super rapid or very slowly and if you don't align our pace across various entities and actors and stakeholders you tend to leave certain groups behind and so and, and in that we tend to you know come back to this question who do we recognize as the innovator Right. Do we recognize the, the, the people in informal settlements innovating frugally, innovating uh, in everyday ways as the innovators or, or must innovation happen in a lab? Now, of course, it happens in, in both places. And, and, and that's pre precisely the point. As long as the outcomes are also in some way supportive of democratic engagement mm -hmm. um, in the in the in the built up space. I, uh, and, and, and I'd really like to come back to it. So if, if people want to get in touch with me over email or Twitter, please do. Um, and and uh, Melissa, if I may, just on the, on the point on positionality, uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what Annie and Noshin have said. It's, this, is, this is a moment, if any, for us to constantly remind ourselves as researchers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, myself based in the North uh, of, of, of my positionality. And indeed, there is a commonality of experience here. We're all, you know, sitting in our little Zoom windows and experiencing life in a very different way. But there is something uh, remarkably different here about uh, Southern experiences or certainly from the Southern urban view. And that is that the violence of the pandemic. So this is the violence that's not just directly as a result of the disease, but also as, as a result of violent lockdowns and the police brutality and other forms of domestic violence that have picked up. Those and the ways that they have been experienced by marginal groups have tended to follow a much longer and deeper trajectory of experiencing everyday violence. And this is something that really needs to be recognized because the North has not experienced those long, deeper um, and more complex associations with the type of violent interactions that have occurred in Southern cities. Okay. Uh, and, and, and so just in, when we recognize our pos positionality, it's, it's useful to keep those uh, differences in mind. Absolutely. Jody, thank you so much. So I think this has been a fascinating session and just a few really big headlines for me, things that I've learned and will take away.
when we think about cities and this pandemic, um, it's happening in the context of big monumental transformations that were already underway of urbanization, population, um, environmental change, infrastructural change, and indeed long histories, including of violence, as, as Jadeep's just pointed out. So that means that we haven't just seen an epidemic crisis, we've seen the coming together of interlocked crises, which people have experienced in very different ways. We've been talking a lot about infrastructure, I think recognizing that that's not just physical, though the physical is important, it's also social infrastructure and virtual infrastructure. Um, and we've been talking about both problems and solutions as being very far from just technical. Um, the technical needs to go along with the social and to be understood in that way and to be understood along with the political. And equity really counts, whether we're talking about gender or, or, or poverty or axes of difference, perhaps with respect to access to services or, or violence. And finally, I think a big take home is the need for a paradigm shift, perhaps a paradigm shift that was already needed, but has re been really marked and accentuated um, by the pandemic um, from simply top-down elite planning to a much more bottom-up inclusive set of processes in which low-income settlement dwellers and city dwellers more generally and those they're connected with in rural areas are leading the way in an inclusive sense and are able to hold elites to account. So um, much more that one could say, I very much hope we can continue the conversation. Please stay in tune with the work that colleagues at IDS are doing in the cities cluster as well as with our partners in these various programs um, and join with me in thanking our contributors enormously for a very interesting evening. Um, please also um, look out for the next in the Suffolk Development Lecture Series, which will be happening on the 12th of November on COVID-19 and development, the politics of uncertainty. So taking forward some issues that I think have emerged today as well, where we'll hear from Andy Sterling at Spru in conversation with Sobia Ahmad Kaka. So thank you all and have a very good rest of the day or the evening, wherever you happen to be. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. bye.